Next speakers. Matt Roper hope, holds a bachelor's degree in history and an MA in sociology from Brigham Young University. He has worked for Farms, the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, and is a researcher and writer for Book of Mormon Central. Kirk Magleby is currently the executive director for Book of Mormon Central. With that short introduction, I'm going to turn the time over to Matt. Brothers and sisters, friends, it's good to be here today. Um, I uh, will see how this goes today. Thirteen years ago, last Sunday, um, celebrating the birth of Joseph Smith, Dr. John Clark, Wade Ardern, and myself gave a presentation at the fair conference, a version of which was also presented at the conf a conference of scholars at the Library of Congress on the anniversary of Joseph Smith's birthday. The purpose of that presentation was to present our initial findings on a project exploring how well the Book of Mormon has fared in terms of science and archaeological discovery. After presenting our initial findings, and some of you may have even seen a chart like this, that several of them that have circulated based on our findings there, after presenting these, um, back 13 years ago, we were all unfortunately unable to continue with our project at that time. Recently, however, I have, uh, I'm situated to be able to revisit uh, research on my contribution to that project and uh, have been working to revise and expand that analysis beyond our initial findings. Today I'd like to share some of the results of that work which I expect to publish and make generally available along with all the relevant documentation. So I'm hopefully by the end of the year we'll be able to do that for you. Um, I want to, before I get into what I just mentioned, I want to spend a, a few minutes, discuss briefly some of the challenges that we face to faith and offer some thoughts about it. You know, one of the themes in the Book of Mormon, it talks a lot about blindness. And when you think about blindness, there are lots of things that can impede our vision. Some of us are farsighted or nearsighted. I have friends that are colorblind. I have, even have a friend who has a prosthetic eye. There's different things that can happen to your eyes that will obscure your vision. And if you're not careful, that can lead you into all kinds of trouble and uh, you'll end up like my grandma was a few years back where I was in the car with her and she was driving down the streets of Gallup, New Mexico and it really frightened me because, uh, and she was very confident, but uh, I was not. There are things, however, that we can generally do to correct our vision, um, whether it's glasses, contact lenses, medicine, surgery. There are things that can happen that can help us so that our vision is not obscured. Now, again, we're talking about challenges to faith. I'm going to read this, and you're familiar with this in the Book of Mormon as we talk about Lehi's dream and Nephi's vision. And Lehi says, It came to pass that there arose a mist of darkness, even an exceeding great mist of darkness, insomuch that they who had commenced in the path did lose their way, that they wandered off and were lost. Now, Nephi, in his vision, points out that these mists of darkness are the temptations of the devil which blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men and lead them away into broad roads that they perish and are lost. So these mists of darkness can be really uh, a problem. Now, as we experience challenges to faith, it's probably good to ask, well, what causes this blindness? What we know that the adversary wants to lead us astray, he wants to make us miserable and eventually destroy us. So, how is it that we become blind? Now this is a, a picture that I kind of makes me think, I like it. We'll call her Sister Jones, is here. She's worked her way up the path. She's exercised face, she got to the tree, she's even partaken of the fruit. 
And now, where are her eyes? If you notice, she's not looking at the tree anymore. She's not even looking at the fruit that's right there in her hands. But her eyes are glancing across the way at that risky piece of real estate hanging over a cliff. But in either case, whether we're people who are on the path and encounter the mists of darkness, or whether we are looking past what we have in our own hands and across the river uh, to that great and spacious building, we are tempted by things that are not truly as they are. And we need a correction in our vision. Now, there are lots of things that, can, that we encounter in life, and this is just one. And again, you know, we talk about the CES letter, which some are familiar with. This is just the latest iteration of this, this kind of thing. Again, the issue here is not an issue of asking questions or of having questions. The issue is how we frame questions. And also, uh, the problem here is, is one of distorting the perspective of those who go to something like this as a resource to answer their questions. Uh, one of the problems that we encounter in that and a lot of sources that criticize the Book of Mormon, you have selective representation of the problems that people mention about the Book of Mormon. Also, you have a selective representation and even a misrepresent misrepresentation of literature that has already addressed those issues, which a person who goes to that resource won't even know are there. Another aspect that distorts our perspective is the omission of favorable evidence for the Book of Mormon, which is usually completely omitted. So the person who goes to such a resource for answers to their questions frequently finds very, uh, a very distorted perspective, kind of like a carnival funhouse in a house of mirrors, where you only have a caricature of what uh, what a defense of the Book of Mormon might even look like. So the person is left, uh, since they've had difficulty finding other reliable sources of information, they're left in confusion, frustration, and anger, and may give up on the faith altogether. So we have this blindness. How do we, uh, how do we deal with that fog that we have to deal with? How do we reduce the blindness that is caused by those mists of darkness that cover our eyes, or at least distort or only give us a partial perspective? Now, when we talk about, I'm going to talk about blindness here in just, again in just a minute, but let me just uh, go here real quick to suggest one thing to preface what I'm going to go into on my current research. Uh, there are things that we can do before we have a faith crisis and that we should all be doing right now. If you haven't had a faith crisis, at some point in your life you're going to have a faith crisis. Most of us, our faith crisis is throughout our lives. Um, but one thing that we can do right now to prepare is to seek for more knowledge if we lack knowledge, to seek for more wisdom if we lack wisdom. And uh, I like this counsel from the Lord in the Doctrine and Covenants. As all have not faith, seek ye diligently and teach one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom, seek learning even by study and also by faith. Now the thing I like about this scripture is it notes that as all have not faith, not everybody has faith, and not everybody has faith in a particular principle. So there are times in our life, there are things in our life that perhaps we struggle with, so that we maybe we haven't really exercised our faith to understand. So the Lord understands this, and he says, okay, if you don't have faith, here's what you do. But you need to seek out of the best resources that are available. And if you do, and if you do it diligently, and you're truly seeking, you can find wisdom, and you can find knowledge that then can help you build faith. And then you'll gain additional knowledge through the faith that you're able to exercise. And so we need to seek for better knowledge. Now, I noticed recently uh, Elder Ballard gave some counsel, and he talks about how even sometimes general authorities have questions that they don't have a ready answer for. We tend to think that general authorities know everything. 
Well, they do when the Lord wants them to know things, okay? But he notes here that there are some times when he has questions. And what does he do? He goes to people who have more information than he does, who specialize in those particular areas. If I wanted to learn about soil archaeology in Mesoamerica, I wouldn't go to my mother-in-law, although she is an authority on many other things. <laughs> I'd go to somebody like um, Richard Hansen or uh, Brother, Ter uh, Brother Terry here who spoke to us, or uh, John Clark, okay, and, uh, and I would go to them for expertise and insight. And he noticed that part of the, in order to get the Holy Ghost to help you, is part of the preparation we need to do is go to the right resources and learn as much as we can. And uh, he also gives some caution for us, and this is true for us personally as well as when we try to help other people. We don't want to increase the fog on the path or increase the fog that obscures a person's vision. Do not pass along faith-promoting or unsubstantiating rumors or outdated understandings and explanations of our doctrine and practices from the past. It's always wise to consult the works of recognized and thoughtful, faithful LDS scholars to ensure you do not teach things that are untrue, out of date, odd, or quirky. And uh, again, that's good counsel that I would suggest to you. Now, what I'm going to talk about the rest of my time here is what I mentioned at the beginning. Um, how is the Book of Mormon done over time? Now, and when we started off our initial uh, project back in 2005, that was what we wanted to do, and we were looking specifically at scientific evidence, evidence from archaeology and so forth. Today, and what I have been doing, I have expanded this a little, uh, I have made a, I've taken a little bit broader approach since I'm not an archaeologist, but I have followed um, some of the discussion about Book of Mormon criticisms over the years. And uh, so let me show you what, uh, how I have approached the subject. If you look at the galaxy of Book of Mormon criticisms, there's a constellation of different questions that could be raised and have been raised about the Book of Mormon. Some deal with 19th century explanations, attempts to show the Book of Mormon is man-made or possible sources of somebody if they were creating the Book of Mormon, theological objections, church history things. We could, all of these are interesting subjects. Um, you can see. I'm focusing on what you see in red there, the anachronisms. These are things that people, beginning in Joseph Smith's day, even before the Book of Mormon was published, were pointing out about the Book of Mormon that they thought were ridiculous, wrong, or absurd. So these are the kinds of arguments that you see when we talk about anachronisms, things relating to ancient warfare, swords, ancient swords, for example, metals, animals, ancient culture, Lehi's Wilderness Trail, um, Book of Mormon names, events in Third Nephi when the, when the Savior died. These are the kinds of things that people have said, well, that's just, that's just abs too absurd for words. So the way that I have approached this is I've had to uh, go through, and this is actually quite a task, to review all anti-Mormon literature on the Book of Mormon from 1830 to 2019. And I've gone through about a thousand publications that deal with arguments against the Book of Mormon since Joseph Smith's day. Divide these criticisms into time periods, 1830 to 1844, uh, and talk about that's the first time period uh, 1845 to 1965 and 1966 to our present day. Um, and then document all the criticisms of the Book of Mormon for each time period, because they're not, not everybody brings up the same thing. Document confirmations, if any, that are based on uh, new information and discoveries during that time period. And then tally the number of non-confirmations or confirmations, be that as it may. So. That is the approach that I have taken. Now, I want to specify, too, that I'm not attempting to show or establish what may or may not have been known in Joseph Smith's day. Now, that's an interesting subject, and some of us have looked at that, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. And again, we're not addressing all issues or questions or possible criticisms of the Book of Mormon. We're specifically looking at anachronisms. 
And, and this is important, we're taking what the critics themselves have said and tracking the status of those issues that they raised. Okay, so we're going to take them at their word, even though some of these arguments aren't particularly good. All right, so here we are. Now, this is how we're going to score these. Unconfirmed uh, category, trending, and confirmed. Okay, so the unconfirmed, which will be in red, Example, pre-Columbian steel. There are no, there's no examples of pre-Columbian steel that have been located by archaeologists. Okay, so that has not been confirmed. That would be an example. Trending, that is not yet confirmed, but the issue has moved to a more favorable perspective than before. An example of this is the bow and arrow. Now, Indians have bow and arrows. You know, they had bow and arrows throughout North and South America, but the issue has more recently been that the, the bow and arrow wasn't there early enough for the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon mentions the bow and arrow. As time has gone by, the evidence for the bow and arrow has been found to be earlier and earlier, particularly in Mesoamerica, although uh, there is some question as to whether it even existed in Book of Mormon times. But the trend has been showing with recent discoveries, including at Aguateca and at uh, I think it was Copan uh, just a few years ago, um, where they have now found uh, examples of bow and arrow in some of the ruins there, um, down to the, uh, the classic period at Copan, for example. And then you have confirmed, which would be an example of a pre-Columbian cement 2,000 years ago. All right, so these are things that have definitely been confirmed. So that's how we're scoring things. Here we go. Okay, our first time period, we're going to look at 1830 to 1844, so the time the Book of Mormon is published to Joseph, the year of Joseph Smith's death. And uh, if you look at this, we find that there were, in those years, 89 anachronisms that were mentioned by critics of the Book of Mormon during that, that were published during that period. 89, okay? And uh, so if we take these and we put them on a chart, back a little bit. We put them on a chart that looks something like this. You see the red again, are the things that there's, haven't been confirmed, or uh, seem like a problem. And uh, green, uh, if you look at, I need two pages on this chart, the green means confirmed. There are only about five of these by the time that Joseph Smith was killed that had been confirmed. And then you see one that's trending there. Okay, but I think that probably should be green as well. So you got five new discoveries that had been confirmed out of the 89 anachronisms, 84 that were unconfirmed when Joseph Smith was murdered. Okay? So that's your first period there. So now let's go on and let's take a look at the next time period, in the next 120 years, 1845 to 1965. Now this, you see, this is the Golden Bible, which was M.T. Lamb, who was a big anti-Mormon in the 1880s, and Camorra Revisited, which was a major, by Charles Shook, it was a major refutation of the mound builder theory as applied to the Book of Mormon, and uh, kind of representative of the age. So we have these uh, criticisms that were raised, and during, now we're in the second time period. This is what we have is, Let me see, have I lost it? There we go. Okay, you can see the chart now. It's a little bit, a uh, little bit of, of change there. You can see again the red. Let me go back. There were uh, one. I think there's a little bit of a lag here. Okay, so 150 Book of Mormon anachronisms. Okay, at that point, that's plus 61 since Joseph Smith's death. So you got 150 problems that critics have said were problems about the Book of Mormon and, and those categories. All right, so you put them on a chart here. Again, you see there has been some more changes. Uh, it looks a little bit better than at the time of Joseph Smith's death. And uh, you see that there have been a few more confirmations and a few things that seem to be trending in a more positive direction during that time period. So this is what the tally by 1965 would be. 150 anachronisms plus 60 since 1844. 22 confirmations, 
and that would be plus 17 since 1844. So you can see there's been some positive things happening. Uh, pl plus five that are trending, and if you add those two together, you'd have 27 that are either confirmed or trending toward confirmation, but you still got 123 that have not been confirmed. There's no confirmation for from the Book of Mormon. Now, why did I divide this up to the, why did I end at 1965? The next, we're going to look at this next time period here, but why 1966? Why do we start there? Well, um, it, it's a personal reason. I was born in 1966. I know that some of you regret that event, but that is the way it is. Um, live with it. Um, and I, I was curious to see, uh, uh, you know, what has happened since I was born as far as Book of Mormon criticisms and what has happened. And uh, so I was curious about this. And so this is our third time period between 1966 and today, 2019. Okay, 205 Book of Mormon anachronisms have been raised since the Book of Mormon was published and mentioned by critics, plus 55 since 1965, okay? So since I was born, and it's all my fault, there's 55 additional uh, criticisms there. Now, you take our list, okay? Remember, these are all the criticisms that we have here, and you have a chart with all these zeros on it here, if you took them and, but again, what we want to look at is okay, what's changed. So this is what we do. So plus 55 criticisms, so we've got 205 here. So how does that look as of 2019 in terms of the unconfirmed, confirmed, and trending? Notice the green, again, refers to confirmations. Red is not confirmed, and the blue is trending toward confirmation. Okay, so here, I don't have time to read all these on the list, but there's, there's quite a few here, as you can see. And uh, this is the second page of, of the chart. So I, I find this kind of interesting to me. Uh, just because of when I started this, this third period to see how much has happened. And the thing that really surprises me, and I, it did surprise me because I didn't expect to see so much of this, is, is the acceleration of confirmation of things that were once considered uh, too silly for words about the Book of Mormon. Um, and again, I'm, I'll be publishing the documentation on these later this year, but I wanted to, uh, to give you an idea here of what it looks like. So, by 2019, 141 confirmed, that is plus 119 since I was born. 26 trending, plus 21 since 65. 167 have been confirmed or trending toward confirmation, 140 since Matt Roper was born. And 38 still remain unconfirmed. So there are still things that we, we uh, have not found any archaeological or other evidence for. To put it another way, though, 70% have been confirmed. 81% are confirmed or either trending toward confirmation. And 19% unconfirmed. Now, again, we're just talking about anachronisms. We're not talking about all of the questions or criticisms or things that a person might raise about the Book of Mormon. But when somebody tells you, well, if the Book of Mormon's true, why haven't we found horses? Book of Mormon can't be true because it mentions steel swords. Well, from my perspective, I can testify, being born in 1965, to having seen plenty of confirmations of things that were thought too silly for words. And uh, I can see uh, that a lot has happened just in that period of time, just in the last 53 years. So let me ask you, what is the next 53 years going to hold in terms of what we learn about the Book of Mormon? I like that Brother Terry talked about the importance of patience. Um, 
There are still issues, questions, and criticisms of the Book of Mormon which have not been verified, but new information and discoveries show that many critics have grossly underestimated the Book of Mormon. It's, it's obvious. This is, this is the case. The, it's there. Um, many things in the Book of Mormon account once considered wrong or absurd can be verified and shown to be accurate uh, or trending toward verification in the future. Because of this, there is reason to believe, plenty of reasons to believe, I would say, that further faith and patience and diligent attention to the Book of Mormon will continue to be rewarded by those who are willing to invest the time and effort to do so. Now, I want to say a word about um, conf that those items which are not confirmed. When I have a question about the Book of Mormon, and I've had many questions, and I still have many questions about the Book of Mormon, things that I, I can't answer, okay? When I have a problem with the Book of Mormon, I try to see in other disciplines, uh, whether archaeology, history, which are kind of the areas that I'm more familiar with, how have those scholars dealt with similar types of problems in their field of study? Okay, so take it out of the controversial realm for a minute. How do you deal with these kinds of problems? And it's helped me to look at what others have said. Let me read you what one uh, biblical archaeologist, a very prominent, very good biblical archaeologist, Kenneth Kitchen, has, has uh, talked about in biblical archaeology. Okay? Think about the Book of Mormon and archaeology when we talk about this. In the field of history, whether it be the patriarchs or David or anyone else, we are repeatedly told that no extra-biblical occurrences of this or that individual have been found. So their historicity is to be dismissed or treated as doubtful, regardless of all other indications. Who does that sound like? Okay, you ever encounter that kind of an argument with the Book of Mormon? No such wrong criterion is applied elsewhere. Why here? Absence of evidence is not and should not be confounded with evidence of absence. The same criticism is to be leveled at the abuse of this concept in archaeology. The syndrome, we did not find it, so it never existed, instead of the more proper formulation, evidence is currently lacking. We may have missed it, or it may have left no trace. Particularly when 5% or less of a mound is dug, leaving 95% or more untouched, unknown, and so not in evidence. So there's some wisdom there from our uh, archaeologists of the Bible, which we can apply to the Book of Mormon. See how we phrase things? Instead of saying, why isn't there this, or we haven't found this, so it can't be true, say, well, evidence is currently lacking. You know, but there may be a number of reasons why that's the case. Another thing about unconfirmed items, is just because they haven't been confirmed by archaeology doesn't mean we don't have an explanation for why that may not have happened yet. And, but that's another, another discussion. Finally, um, let me just, uh, before I turn it over to Kirk Magleby here, I want to share something from Elder Neil A. Maxwell, uh, who talked about evidence in faith. And this is just to kind of give you perspective and hope and remove a little bit of, of the fog as you keep in mind what we've just talked about. He says, all of the scriptures, including the Book of Mormon, will remain in the realm of faith. Science will not be able to prove or disprove Holy Writ. However, enough plausible evidence will come forth to prevent scoffers from having a field day, but not enough to remove the requirement of faith. Believers must be patient during such unfolding, just like Brother Terry said. There will be, however, he says, a convergence of discoveries. Never enough, mind you, to remove the need for faith to make plain and plausible what the modern prophets have been saying all along. You do not expect incontrovertible proof to come in this way? No, but neither will the church be outdone by hostile or pseudo-scholars. Uh, so I like that and submit that to you from Elder Neely Maxwell. Um, so before I, I'm going to turn this over to Kirk now, but I just, I wanted to leave this with you to give you a perspective. And again, I'll publish the documentation later this year and make it available. Um, but I just want to uh, suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that the mist uh, obscures a lot of things. And uh, as we look to the past and see where we've been, 
we need to take that into account as we wrestle with challenges today. But we have hope for the future as we see more that more is coming until eventually the Lord comes and he'll, he'll reveal it all. But in the meantime, we need to prepare ourselves and learn more and exercise our faith in what we have. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Time Vindicates the Prophets. That was an old radio show from 1954. Those are uh, Hugh Nibley's words. I'm going to go through some of the more recent things that have shown this same phenomenon. That with hard work and over time, uh, we in fact can uh, come to some strong conclusions about the historicity of uh, ancient Restoration Scripture. <clears throat> this first one is... Okay, uh, this is a book that was published in uh, 2009 by former Senator uh, Bob Bennett. He had experience before becoming a U.S. Senator in forensic uh, investigations of forgeries such as the Howard Hughes will. He applies standard investigative techniques towards the Book of Mormon and concludes that it could not have been a forgery because it fails all the standard tests for forgeries. Uh, okay, what am I doing wrong here? Okay. Uh, these are no-whys. We began to publish no-whys on January 1st of, of 2016. We published 527 no-whys in English. 525 of those have now been translated and published in Spanish. This is the most uh, accessible corpus of Book of Mormon scholarship in this dispensation, the most impactful. Well over a million people have now interfaced with these uh, no-whys. When we very first came up with this uh, rather unconventional name, uh, we said, it will come to have meaning in our culture as we do our work well. And that's very true. The church itself is now producing the equivalent of a know why, including this little signature phrase we have at the end, and now you know why. <clears throat> we have, in uh, 2017, Matt Cutler, who's in the audience today, uh, began to produce for us a series of videos. We put up uh, their own uh, YouTube channel. These are what we call, we call our evidence videos. <laughs> They've had well over 800 million or 800,000 uh, views up to this point. These are high uh, production quality videos, and they walk through a number of evidences of, uh, the, of the Book of Mormon in a very compelling way. <clears throat> we published in uh, 2017 uh, a, a book that was a compendium of the first 137 no whys. This takes us about through the middle of Alma, <clears throat> and this has been uh, a, a nice addition to our repertoire. We then have a blog at uh, Book Mormon Central, and we highlight a number of things that show how trending archaeological, historical, linguistic, and uh, literary uh, sorts of evidences are coming together to show the Book of Mormon to be uh, authentic ancient history. <clears throat> this, this one happens to be one of our more popular blog articles that resulted from the Pakinam LIDAR survey in, uh, that, that broke in February of uh, 2018. National Geographic made a special about this. And it was all the rage. It went viral very, very quickly. And we showed how it was strong evidence uh, that the, the uh, Book of Mormon uh, had, in fact, uh, been uh, corroborated to a large degree by what we're now finding in the jungles of Guatemala. <clears throat> we really like Matt Bowen. <clears throat> You're going to have a chance to, to uh, hear from him right after uh, Jasmine's uh, presentation on our Scripture Plus product. But uh, this is really, really good stuff. <clears throat> uh, uh, after Pakinam LIDAR comes out with National Geographic, the work's not done. They've got to go out and get archaeologists on the ground and go to ground truth, what, to what the airborne surveys showed. And uh, that came uh, out now in September of 2018 in the journal Science. This has my blog where I uh, well, went through and, and itemized uh, some of the things they found and, and reported. And it is remarkable. Uh, virtually everything that we wanted about the fortifications of the Book of Mormon have now been corroborated uh, by this particular study. <clears throat> There's a wonderful lady who's uh, uh, now uh, in her 91st year, and she published this book called The Challenge the Book of Mormon Makes to the World when she was 90 years old. This just came out in November of this last year. Uh, she took Hubie Brown's old challenge to the Book of Mormon, first articulated in 1955, and uh, did a book-length uh, treatment on it, delightful uh, reading material. We had a lot to do with this, but uh, kudos to, to uh, Grace Jones. And this really helps us someone understand uh, why uh, Joseph Smith simply could not have written this book. <clears throat> then this book that came out in February of this year, 
We love Elder Collister's current book, and you'll get to hear him on Friday. So he'll be uh, next, uh, right, right before uh, Dan Peterson's closing remarks on Friday, talking about this very book. It's terrific, and um, uh, there's just no question. Uh, there is a very, very strong case to be made for the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> now, I really like this article, and uh, uh, hats off to Dan Peterson and his uh, uh, team there to interpret it. I had the guts to publish this. But we've got a couple of, uh, of engineers here who said, you know what, let's go take a look at statistical analysis and see if the Book of Mormon really fits in an ancient uh, Mesoamerican context. And they came up with a probability number that, that was off the charts. <clears throat> that, yeah, the probability is extraordinarily high that this book fits in this ancient context. Well, uh, the naysayers and the critics and so forth had a field day. And I have it on good authority that this is the most heavily commented article interpreters ever published. <clears throat> so the, the, our author came to our office a few weeks ago. We sat down and, and went through all of the, the, the comments, pros and cons, that were accruing on this very interesting article. <clears throat> And here's what we decided to do. <clears throat> and this is his closing argument now as I, Alan Wyatt's uh, shut down uh, comments on this uh, particular thread. Went back to the very first edition of the book that he had used as his um, a starting point for analysis, the ninth edition of the Maya by uh, Coe and Houston. Went back to the first edition published in 1966, and this is an example of what Matt, uh, Brand, uh, uh, Matt Roper was just talking about. Over time, with an authentic ancient historical document, the evidence gets much, much stronger. So uh, the Dales found 79 correspondences in the 1966 edition of this book. They found 131 correspondences in the ninth edition. And of the 79 correspondences in 1966, 30 of them are much, much stronger by the time we get to the, to, uh, the uh, uh, 2015 edition. This is a very good example of this phenomenon, time vindicating the prophets. <clears throat> Current Maya scholarship currently supports this uh, conclusion. That there's a strong affinity between uh, the ancient Mesoamerican context and the Book of Mormon. And I would point you to these uh, uh, three uh, resources right here. And they are remarkable, uh, what they uh, put on the table. Very, very recent, the very cutting edge stuff. And it uh, demonstrates uh, that something is going on here. Uh, very precise. In some cases, it's almost like paraphrasing what's in the, in the Book of Mormon. And much of this because we now can read Mayan texts, and they're coming forth in droves. <clears throat> and it's very exciting. Some of these Mayan texts actually go back in, into very close to Book of Mormon times. OK, uh, what, would be, what would it be like if we could actually have an ad campaign out across the internet to, to, to get people to read the Book of Mormon? We're, we're doing that at Book of Mormon Central. In the last 90 days, we've shared about 6 million ad impressions, and we've driven a lot of traffic back to our uh, uh, website. And this is all about the Book of Mormon, uh, clear and convincing. The Book of Mormon will change your life. The Book of Mormon, beautiful, miraculous, true, these sorts of things. Uh, we took a, a team down to San Diego in February to learn digital marketing because it was a, a bit of a weak spot in our organization. And you're seeing the first results of that now beginning to happen. Some of you may have seen some of these ads. <clears throat> OK, big reveal, drum roll. We're going to make history. The church came to us end of last year and said, Book of Mormon Central, can you help us with the Book of Abraham? Because we're getting completely ambassed by the forces arrayed against us out there on the internet. They're making it too easy for our kids to go out there and uh, be ensnared and deceived and led into a rabbit hole of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And they're making it too easy to tell the story that Joseph Smith was this, or Joseph Smith was that, or Joseph Smith didn't know this, or this got, uh, that, that, that Egyptologists don't uh, co corroborate with this, or, 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 or don't agree with this anymore. We've been patiently working now for nine months, eight months, and we announced today, you were here, you saw it, you were part of this. It went live about four hours ago. Pearl of Great Price Central. It's visually striking. It has a tremendous bibliography. Some of the most important faithful scholars in the church have collaborated with us on this project. John Gee, I talked to earlier here today, he's been part of this project. Carrie Muelstein, terrific Egyptologist. And John Thompson, who's currently the Institute Director back in Cambridge. 
all wonderful credentialed brethren. What we've done is brought together for the Pearl of Great Price, specifically the Book of Abraham, some of the same kinds of resources we've been doing now for three and a half years under Jack Welch's direction with the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> so this is what you'll expect to find on, uh, or what you can find. Bring it up right now on your mobile devices right there. It's, it's there as we speak, Pearl of Great Price Central. And uh, this is what you will find as you go down there. Uh, we've put five articles, five essays up now that talk about different aspects of the Book of Abraham. These are some of the five. We've got uh, an essay here about did Lehi lie about his wife Sarah, the Ur of the Chaldees, the plain of Olashem, one of the, the, the toponyms mentioned in the text, human sacrifice, and Abraham and uh, Idrami. There will be at least 40 of these articles. We've got most of them written already. We're going to be publishing these uh, approximately one a week now for the next several uh, months as, as we roll this thing out. So come on back from time to time and, and check out what's going on. <clears throat> We've got a nice bibliography here on this site that has several different access paths. One thing that you'll notice here going forward with the things that we're going to be doing at Book Mormon Central, we're paying a lot of attention to user interfaces. We haven't had really high quality user interface design up to this point. We've just sort of cobbled things together with graphic designers, not the best we could to throw up a, a Drupal site or a WordPress site or whatever. But we're now beginning to pay serious attention to UXD, uh, user interface uh, design types of principles. And simply the way you build indices into complex materials can make a big difference in the way that a, a individual may or may not be able to find the stuff. So this is an example of uh, some of the things uh, that, that we've done to make a nice uh, collapsible index here into the bibliography. It's all fully uh, hyperlinked. Click on these things, it takes you to uh, such places as Scholar's Archive at BYU, where a lot of the good stuff is, is now headquartered, uh, the RSC, uh, the occasional interpreter article, that sort of thing. <clears throat> Book of Mormon Central has just spawned Pearl of Grace Price Central. And that gives you an idea of where we're headed. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Tim, uh, take me back to my PowerPoint, please. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> there will be a new book coming out in October of this uh, year. Actually, that's uh, wrong on, on the slide. It should say October 2019. The second volume of the Know Why series. The next 127 that takes us through the second half of the Book of Mormon. So with these no whys, we'll now have a two-volume set, which will uh, uh, enable uh, someone to get profound insights into the text of the Book of Mormon. And then the other major announcement, uh, well, actually, there's, another, there, there's even a larger announcement that Jasmine gets to do here in, uh, at, at the uh, 3 o'clock hour. So come back for Jasmine. But we are publicly announcing, not unveiling yet, but publicly announcing a whole new paradigm in how to deal with evidences. It's called Evidence Central. Evidence Central is a collaboration between Karis Legacy Foundation and Book Mormon Central. We're throwing everything that we've learned in the last three and a half years into this thing. We've got the very best technology that we can possibly get into this. We've got the very best design uh, principles. And we're using what Jack Welch has learned over the last 40 years. Can you imagine? He's been on the, on the faculty of the BYU Law School for 40 years now. And we're taking what he has learned about the evidentiary process <clears throat> and about making things <clears throat> through this burden of proof hierarchy that starts out with something that's merely possible and gets all the way down to something that's beyond reasonable doubt. And we're making this into a, uh, a system whereby people can have a safe haven where they can spend time with faith-affirming, positive, uplifting, uh, evidentiary evidence material that will strengthen testimonies and strengthen faith and have a really, really fun time doing it. The forces arrayed against us have become so good at entrapping our youth. Uh, I heard a sad story the other day from a, a fellow who's on the faculty of the BYU uh, Religion Department. He said a mom uh, brought her, her return missionary son into my office 
He's taken off his garments. He said, I'm out of here. I'm checking out. I never want to, to, to be part of this again. She wanted him, before he actually walked out the door, she wanted him to go talk to this particular religion professor. And he asked him one question. He said, so tell me how you spend your time online. How much time do you spend with the Book of Mormon every day? Zero. How much time do you spend with sites which are calculated to deceive you and lead you astray and fill your mind with darkness every day? And it was a vast amount of time that this, this young man uh, was, was uh, spending with these kinds of sites. Why do they do it? Because they're enticing. Because there is entrapment going on. Because there are psychological principles at work here which make this addictive, sticky sites, just like a video game. <clears throat> Want to go back and do it over and over and over again. We've been negligent, <clears throat> those of us who care about our youth and who care about the, the, the future of this church and who care about uh, the truth and who care about uh, the restoration scripture. We've been negligent about providing the same kind of very immersive, experiential-based technology to the students of the scriptures. We're solving that with this particular project. Evidence Central, which uh, uh, we're announcing today, but it won't be available until October. And Ryan Daly is here in the audience. He's the, the uh, director of content for, for Evidence Central. And we're bringing together <clears throat> content and technology in such a way that a person will be able to go in and spend a tremendous amount of time, have a great time doing it, uh, access things from many different angles, many different perspectives, lots of different indices, with all kinds of, of points of departure to get to, uh, back in, into the good stuff, uh, and yet uh, be f uh, affirmed in their testimony, <clears throat> and have things corroborated in their mind, and have it make sense, and have this be logically and, 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 and intuitively satisfying uh, to them as they go through. That is Evidence Central. <clears throat> That's what we're all about right now at uh, Book of Mormon Central. It's been quite a ride. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, with, with our, uh, our uh, marquee project uh, coming up in the next hour. But uh, God bless us, everyone. <clears throat> Fair Mormon is doing remarkable work. We love these guys. <clears throat> as is Book of Mormon Studies, as is uh, the uh, Interpreter Foundation uh, organization, as is uh, the LDS Perspectives podcast with the Hales, as are many, many other wonderful organizations. It's been, it's been such a thrill to see the Joseph Smith Papers Project uh, progress the way it has, to, to see the Church Historian's Office begin to produce something as good as Saints. We love the Saints uh, volume. This type of history is what we've needed for a long time, and the fact that we've now got it, uh, bless the, those uh, inspired leaders who are allowing our historians to do work of, of this high a caliber and this high quality and, and th this, this uh, uh, inclusive uh, nature. And we at Book of Mormon are trying to do our part <clears throat> to hold up our end of uh, the uh, bargain because the Book of Mormon is worth everything we can possibly do. It's worth our very, very best effort. Uh, this is our mission statement of Book of Mormon Central. We build faith, enduring faith in Jesus Christ by making the Book of Mormon accessible, comprehensible, and defensible to the entire world. And now this is the mission statement of Pearl of Great Price Central. <laughs> We build enduring faith in Jesus Christ by making the Pearl of Great Price accessible, uh, comprehensible, and defensible to the entire world. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, the link is pearlofgreatpricecentral.org, not .com, .org. Pearl of Great Price Central, it's all spelled out, P-E-A-R-L-O-F-G-R-E-A-T-P-R-I-C-E, Central, C-N-T-R-A-L, <laughs> it's a mouthful. Just think Grand Central Station, all, ro all, all trains uh, come into the one uh, big train station. This is the uh, uh, sum of all knowledge, this is the consortium of, of all the, the good resources out there. A one-stop shop, pearlofgreatpricecentral.org. Okay, please, <coughs> please tell the rest of the story about the, uh, the mother and her RM son. Well, <coughs> this RM son was very impressed with some of the things he found uh, on the Book of Mormon Central website, and we can only hope and pray. He hasn't put his garments back on yet, <coughs> as far as I know. 
what are the plans for translating Bookmark Central, Program Press Central, um, Evidence Central to other languages, especially German? All right. <clears throat> We're publishing in Spanish. We have done since 2017. It takes us about $20,000 a month to run our Spanish uh, organization. We made a run at Portuguese here a little while ago, and we just decided we didn't have the, the, the uh, financial resources uh, to make a go of it. I cannot get into a language until I do it right. Here's, here's the problem. This isn't just translation. I can't just hire any old Tom, Dick, or Harry to translate this. This is not like uh, Elias Living sorts of, of, of uh, 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 relatively fluffy stuff, okay? Uh, we're talking scripture. We're talking history. We're talking... We're trouble here, you know. <laughs> it's okay. Well, you, 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 you're going to deal with this, my friend. But... Uh, uh, in order for me to translate into Spanish and have actual um, uh, verifiable results, I need to have translators who have master's degrees in biblical studies from bona fide uh, religious institutions. Noe Correa in, uh, was in the audience here earlier today. He's one of our translators. It takes full-time people. My lead translator has a PhD, basically. It takes serious uh, uh, folks to do the sorts of translation in order for us not to have street talk, in order for us to have actual uh, sorts of things that scriptural scholars will respect, okay? And that's our trademark of, of what we do at Bookmark Central. So uh, uh, Jack Welch would love nothing more than getting into German, I assure you. But uh, Portuguese is next on our list because that's where the, the large numbers of saints are. And it's all a matter of us being able to, to uh, generate the donor support that we need to be able to put an organization together. But we wouldn't do it uh, that fast if we could. Uh, when will Bookmark Central, now Program Press Central, be taken down by Google. Oh, this is so interesting. We were already taken down by Google. <clears throat> when we launched in, on January 1st of uh, 2016, we had made the mistake of announcing that we were going to be on YouTube. Well, we put up the first video on YouTube, and uh, a whole bunch of haters went out there and immediately complained to Google that we're spamming them. Well, Google took our YouTube channel down like that. If you go in there and actually uh, seriously look at that, our YouTube channel that now has millions of views and hundreds of videos and so forth, you'll see that we published like 20 videos on the 27th of January. And we had to literally go <clears throat> to the uh, bishop of, of the singles ward in Palo Alto, California, who has a bunch of Googlers on his, in, in his ward, and we had to go plead our case, and it took us quite a while for us to actually get our YouTube channel uh, back up and, and operational uh, from uh, Google itself. Could they take us down? <clears throat> We have some insiders, okay? Uh, it was, um, uh, what, about a year or so ago, no, a little over a year or so ago that, that we took a, a delegation down to Google, and uh, that led directly to the project you're going to see here in, in, in a few minutes. But uh, we met with some senior people who are good, faithful Latter-day Saints, and we've maintained that relationship since. Uh, Google just gave, it, gave us a grant, a Google grant, uh, to actually use their ad network to publicize uh, a Book of Mormon sorts of things. We thought that was pretty cool. We haven't begun to take advantage of it yet because <clears throat> I need to go out and get uh, somebody who's a real expert in Google AdWords to be able to really make use of, of, of that donation. But nonetheless, uh, as of right now, we think, we think we're okay uh, moving forward with this. Uh, I, I showed you that ad campaign out there. Half of that ad campaign is, is, is uh, going to YouTube. And we're promoting some of our very top YouTube videos with YouTube advertising right now. And that puts money directly into Google's pockets. So money talks. <clears throat> All right, let me just take two. Let me just take two. I only got time for just a couple here. Um, first of all, um, how was the bow and arrow confirmed in 1830 to 1844, but is trending today? OK, well, remember what, I was, what I'm taking is what the critics actually said. OK, sometimes the critics say lots of things, OK? But in, in, what happened in, is in Joseph Smith's day, there were critics that were saying they didn't, ever, they didn't have the Book of Mormon, they didn't have the bow and arrow in, in, uh, in what would have been Book of Mormon times. What we've seen, however, is a trend in more and more. So they, they had bow and arrows. The critics didn't really uh, specify when they needed to have the bow and arrow, but they've since been more specific, and so we have to address that criticism. So it was listed as initially confirmed but there's a separate category for bow and arrow early on the chart to, to deal with what the subsequent critics have said. How do you rate horses in the Book of Mormon? Um, I would rate uh, uh, horses as trending. 
The reason for that is because uh, beginning in Joseph Smith's day, people were saying throughout much of the 19th century, there never ever were any horses in the Americas before Columbus. That was the initial argument. Then when Latter-day Saints started noticing, oh, there are these discoveries where we found these, these horses, the critics said, well, yeah, but uh, that was, uh, that was um, it wasn't contemporary with man. And they found some that were seemed to be contemporary with man. I said, well, yes, but it's still too early for the Book of Mormon. Well, now what we found, we even have uh, a number of examples of, of horse bones being found that date past the Pleistocene time, so that's past 9 or 8,000 BC, down into just a few thousand years ago. Um, and there are examples of that. There's still a ways to go on that in terms of further south and finding these, and uh, Brother Terry talked a little bit about some of the issues there. So it is a trending, the same with the elephant, I would put that. And uh, just one last thing here. Um, when are the charts going to be published? Uh, tr uh, trying to find the set from 13 years ago was like the sealed portion of the plates. Indeed, and, uh, and you have no idea, when I changed jobs three years ago, I, uh, I almost lost the entire file that I had those. Fortunately, I had backups, so we were able to, to do that. So yes, um, I'm not entirely sure. We're probably going to incorporate that into what we're doing with Evidence Central, but I also intend to get all the information together for this project all in one place and make it available later this year regardless. So thank you. Yeah. We just sent Jonathan Riley, who used to be in charge of our know-how production, uh, back to Catholic University of Washington City to get his PhD in Biblical Studies. Matt Roper's now taking over, so uh, he'll be responsible for publishing know-how. You'll see all kinds of good stuff coming from Matt Roper here soon.